What I'm going to talk about tonight is Illyri, obviously, um, something that we're calling the Creative Laboratory, which is at Illyri, and what we're calling the New Land Art, or, well, I'm not calling it, it's international movement that's happening um, on in land art and environmental art. So, Illyri, the Imaging the Land International Research Initiative aims to open a dialogue across a wide spectrum of contemporary approaches to imaging the land, from indigenous and non-indigenous, local and international perspectives, and to, prom to promote new ways of perceiving the land in the 21st century. And of course, it's imaging, it's about imaging land, but it's also about imagining land differently. Just in terms of how O'Leary came about, um, early in the 1990s, uh, two artists and lecturers at uh, College of Fine Arts, Terry O'Donnell and Dr. Idris Murphy, um, discovered that the university had a scientific research station at Fowler's Gap, as Ian has been speaking about, um, in the desert, in the Australian desert. And they just thought, what a wonderful opportunity. So they went out there and then started to take field trips of predominantly in the early stages painting and drawing students. And I joined them. Um, in about the mid-1990s. And um, as we kept going out there and students uh, worked out there, we realised that it was such a, a wonderful opportunity. We needed to even open it up more, not only to our students. So then, unfortunately, Terry retired, and then it was left to Idris and I. And then also Ian Grant, who also taught here, another artist. The three of us established Aleary. In the past few years, Illyri's interests have grown to incorporate cross-disciplinary projects that explore how we perceive and ultimately live in a land particularly vulnerable to climate change. Although based in Sydney, Illyri has access to the Australian outback through the university's Fowler's Gap Research Station, which is located in the corner country of New South Wales far west, 110 kilometres north of Broken Hill which is a historic mining town. It's a 100,000 acre property, it's huge. I certainly haven't seen all of it. Um, and it's comprised of desert, semi-arid grassland and scrubland. This is actually a photo of some emus with her baby chicks in um, at Fowler's Gap. One of the many advantages of the Fowler's Gap Research Station is its proximity to some of the wonderful national parks of this region all of which are important Aboriginal sites. Over the years, we've taken artists and students to Mutawindji National Park. I always take students to Mutawindji National Park because it's a very important Aboriginal sacred site and they have some fantastic uh, rock art there. We also have been to Kinchika National Park and these photos I, I took some years ago now and of course that particular lake, Lake Menindi, is full of water at the moment so it's extraordinary. And we've been to Mungo National Park, which is a bit like being on the face of the moon, and also Sturt National Park, which is right up in the corner of the state and uh, where you can wander through the red sand hills of the Streslecky Desert. It's just the edge of the Streslecky Desert. From this map, you can see the proximity of Fowler's Gap to those uh, national parks that I've just mentioned. The O'Leary Vision incorporates three functions of education, research and the provision of artists' residencies. So O'Leary offers annual field trips to the Fowler's Gap Research Station, which undergraduate and postgraduate students can take as an elective. Recently, last year, I wrote a new course, which is an, in addition to the original um, electives that, that still run to this day. And the new course that I've written is called Art and the Environment, Studies in the Field. This intensive course is designed to engage students who have a concern for environmental issues with the aim of searching for new paradigms that help to alter public perception about the meaning and significance of the land 
and that challenge conventional thinking. The difference with this course, apart from the fact that it's concentrating on environmental issues, is that students can come from the fine arts, but they can also come from design, architecture, engineering and science. All the electives end with an exhibition here at COFA. And these are just some images from last year's exhibition. Um, this was actually a piece by uh, an engineering student called A Finite Difference. Uh, her name's Irene Chong. And it was interesting in that she took images that uh, she'd photographed out at Fowler's Gap and she superimposed a model that simulates the outcomes when groundwater resources are used beyond its limit. And according to this model she was using, it showed that in fact the, aqua, the aquifer is being, certainly this was prior to all this rain, the aquifer is being overused and it was, it was quite scary the way that all those little numbers disappeared after a while. This is another piece from last year. It's uh, called The Pugilist by Adam Gibson and Stella MacDonald. And it was a video. A lot of students did made videos um, and performances. All sorts of things happened out there. Uh, and it's really a metaphor for about what we're doing to that land. This is a piece by Melissa Bewolf and it's called Bonsai Woody Weed. Um, and it's around the notion of, I mean, bonsai, we normally consider a, the, a bonsai of some beautiful, delicate tree and the idea of actually bonsaiing something that maybe we would want to get rid of in normal circumstances. Now, um, the second thing I wanted to speak about was the residencies for local and international artists. And in fact, anyone here could apply um, to have a residency out at Fowler's Gap. So O'Leary's Residential Arts Centre at Fowler's Gap is the only residency for artists in the Australian desert. This is what I'm told. Um, as a member of Res Artis, which is the International Association of Artists' Residencies, we attract national and international artists to reside and work at this unique centre. And we have an ongoing program of constructing purpose-built artists living studios at Fowler's Gap. And of course, this is where Project X will come in a little bit later. Um, there are a number of accommodation, accommodation options at Fowler's um, Gap including cottages and dormitories. This is one of the older houses, one of the older cottages that uh, sometimes we stay in. Quite a few years ago now, we built uh, a remote studio called the Oka House, and this is it. And it, it really is very remote. Um, it, you, to get there from just the homestead complex, you have to drive a, about 20, 20 minutes, I think, and you absolutely must have a, a four-wheel drive. This is the studio that um, was constructed as a result of a grant from um, the Student Association, or the Student Union, I should say. Okay, the third thing that, of course, O'Leary is involved in is research. As a research initiative, O'Leary attracts honours, Master of Fine Arts, and PhD students. We have also held exhibitions and participated in conferences, both nationally and internationally. So, for example, in 2006, we were involved in an exhibition in Paris. More recently, O'Leary has begun to explore interdisciplinary research into ecological issues through collaborations between artists, architects, and scientists from cross-cultural <coughs> perspectives. This initiative began in 2006 when we were in invited to attend a conference in the Netherlands titled the Zangsperen Project. And the aim of this week-long conference was to explore the rural area of Devenen, which is being encroached upon by surrounding cities, even though it's sinking. Um, and certainly things are going to get worse with um, climate change. And so it was interesting bringing the Dutch, the Dutch and the Australians coming together. We both have problems with water, but in different ways, of course. The uniqueness of this project lay in its inclusion of artists to generate fresh insights into the development and future demands in Holland's green heart. O'Leary decided to reciprocate the invitation and in September 2007, we held a symposium at the Fowler's Gap Research Station titled, Recognising the Land to See Anew. The symposium brought together artists, architects, writers, scientists, environmental planners and indigenous elders from two quite different countries, Australia and Holland to explore the issue of sustainability in the arid zone, water management, land ownership, and how cultural perceptions of land contribute to present land use. 
Um, and we did things like visited certain projects that are existing in Broken Hill. So for example, there's this uh, very interesting people in Broken Hill. And this was a doctor and an artist who got together and planted um, an olive grove on lead contaminated land. And they have found that you can't eat the olives because there's still lead, but you can eat the olive oil. Um, and so we actually all tasted the olive oil, which was quite delicious, but, and we're still here to tell the tale. So that's an interesting uh, idea, you know, that you can eat the olive oil from this la uh, lead contaminated land. This is the previous um, director of Fowler's Gap, who's scientist, David Croft, explaining what the scientists were doing on this land um, with some of the participants. And also we visited um, sacred sites. So this is a very special sacred site called Uriawi. You may recognise uh, Dean Ian Howard there to the left. Um, and we've got um, uh, Badger Bates, who again is talking to us about this particular site, which is sacred because it has a water hole. And he also explained some of the rock art in that area. So as a result of the symposium, O'Leary has instigated or been involved in a number of initiatives. For example, upon retor returning to Holland, the Dutch held an exhibition in Utrecht titled Parallel Universe, Recognising the Land, to which myself and a couple of other Australian artists contributed works. And also I've been trying to uh, work on a travelling exhibition which uh, will tour, hopefully eventually, um, regional Australia and that include artists at the forefront of environmental art in Australia. It got to the point for me in particular that with the ever increasing number of natural disasters occurring worldwide, we started to investigate the role of the artist in relation to climate change in earnest. And of course these are images of um, Ash Wednesday, the, those, that terrible fire that occurred down in, in uh, Victoria. And of course we probably all remember that dust storm um, that came over Sydney where the soil was actually coming from the centre of Australia. So these sort of things really got me thinking. I became interested in what is being called the new land art, echo art, or environmental art. It seems to have many, many titles. A question that is being asked by artists worldwide is whether the aesthetic can contribute to the debate around climate change. Artists often work across disciplines, revealing new insights and asking questions along the way. There are models operating in Europe, Asia and the States that are exploring ways to address the problem through a hybrid art science lens. In the United Kingdom, research has shown that interdisciplinary teams led by the arts dealing with social regeneration initiatives are growing in number. Many of these are focused on the environment, including diversification of rural land use with research showing that a direct benefit to local economies occurs as a result of this creative input. So one of the other things that I've done since that symposium, or that O'Leary has done, I should say, is um, we have established what we're calling the Creative Laboratory out at Fowler's Gap. And what the Creative Laboratory is, it's about a thousand acres of land. So it's an area of land that is, has been set aside for artists and teams of architects, artists, engineers, scientists, anyone who's really concerned with environmental issues can collaborate on projects that explore new ways of perceiving and interacting with the land in the arid zone. So there may even be some people in this room who would like to put forward a project and it's just wonderful to have this area of land that we can experiment with. The aim of the the creative laboratory is to search for new paradigms and to help to alter public perception about the meaning and significance of the land and to challenge conventional thinking. It offers artists the opportunity to restore sites and to work with the land in collaboration with experts. A model that has interested me in establishing the creative laboratory is the Land Foundation in, uh, which is near Chiang Mai in Thailand and I visited here a, a, about two years ago. It was started in 1998 near the village of Samptong by two artists, one of whom is Rukrit Tiruvanijai, I think. And so what they did is they, they set aside this land and invited artists internationally and nationally, farmers, students from the local university, and they do things like 
cultivate rice, experiment with biogas, photovoltaics and experimental construction. So the whole land is um, based on, the, on uh, the body in terms of the relationship of water to land mass and um, also the, some of the poetry of a, a Thai uh, poet they use. Um, one group of artists that uh, have actually established their energy system there is an art, a group of artists called Superflex and they're from Denmark. Very interesting group of artists. They travel to third world countries and set up energy systems using, in this instance, biogas. So the biogas is made from the buffalo dung and, that, and it's stored in that orange balloon. Another mo model that has interested me is the reclamation project called AMD and Art, or Acid Mine Drainage and Art, in an old mining town called Vintondale in Pennsylvania, USA. In 1995, a man called Alan Comp had the idea to reclaim toxic former coal mines using not only science, but elements of design, sculpture and history to spur community involvement and create vital public spaces. When the underground mine, mine shut down and the coal companies skipped town, they left behind a poisonous discharge of sulfuric acid and iron which is known as acid mine drainage. The team designed six keystone-shaped ponds at the eastern end of the property. A half mile away, acid mine drainage was pouring out of a mine portal uh, uh, into Blacklick Creek, which was the one I just showed you a minute ago, at a rate of 200 gallons per minute. Today, the drainage is pumped into the first treatment pond, where instead of taking the typical approach of using sodium hydroxide to neutralize the acid, they line the pond bottom with limestone that naturally draws iron out of the water. The discharge then flows downhill into the other ponds, growing cleaner with each filter process until it is ready to return to the creek. Alan Conk calls this art that works under the premise that art has a job to do in today's environmentally challenged world. The AMD and Art Park has interested me particularly because of the similarities that can be made with the mining town of Broken Hill. For the past few years, Elyri has been working with the Broken Hill Art Exchange on a project that aims to innovate, to diversify and to explore a future for Broken Hill full of creativity, economic success, environmental sustainability and posit positive social outcomes after the mining companies leave town, which will happen uh, in not too long. One of these projects comes from an idea that I had that stems from the frustration of witnessing dry riverbeds turn into a flood of water in the rare occasion of rain at Fowler's Gap, but then watching every precious drop of water disappear. The idea involves constructing the walls for a building out of water tanks, whereby the walls are filled with water, creating the desirable thermal mass and capturing water for future uh, use. A feasibility study for the water tank house has resulted from a collaboration with a group of final year engineering students. So this is where, you know, I, obviously I couldn't solve the problem myself, so I approached engineering and a group of students were very interested in the project, so they took it on board as um, one of their projects for their, their study and they came up with this, theme, uh, this uh, uh, feasibility study which, fa which found that the thermal mass created by the use of water in the water tanks would actually be better than stone or concrete. And that little graph there is basically showing, particularly in an area like uh, Broken Hill where it's hot in the day and, and cold at night, so by the time the water heat, heats up it would be um, at the end of the day and it would be keep the house warm at night. A second collaboration with engineering students has resulted in a plan to build a gallery or museum devoted to art, the environment and sustainability. And my understanding is that this will be the first of its kind in Australia and this is what I'm working on at the moment. The idea is to eventually construct the gallery using the water tank house principle and to make the building completely sustainable. Alan Giddy, who spoke to you last week from area, um, and his brilliance with energy systems. Uh, he's expressed interest in doing the solar energy system for the building. 
So in a sense, the gallery itself becomes a living artwork that exemplifies the principle of the gallery, surrounded by gardens that contribute food, like bush tucker, so we've been out there and eaten things like wattle seed ice cream and wattle seed coffee and uh, salt bush, you can eat salt bush, salt bush and bush tomato pie, and um, also interactive educational playgrounds. This is uh, an unfinished sculpture um, of the, the ideas behind the water tank house, um, which I'm actually working on with some wonderful people out in Broken Hill, just to sort of show the ideas of, of it. Another project I've been working on is the construction of a building out of junk, literally. This is what we call the bottle wall. So this entire wall has been built out of bottles, lots of wine bottles. The idea here again is rather than using materials, having to buy materials, we, the only material we end up having to buy was some concrete, but the stones are all just local stones from the, the bushland around, and then each of these coloured forms are me painstakingly sculpting around each bottle with concrete. It's, it's not going to be a vi something viable to do on mass, but still it creates um, a quite, particularly when the sun shines through it, it's, it's quite, quite amazing. So that's the bottle war. In the past year or so, my involvement and interest in environmental art has led to invitations to speak at conferences internationally, which has been wonderful. In 2009, a huge conference was held in New Mexico in the United States, titled Land Art. The event lasted six months, including lectures, exhibitions, site-specific artworks, and a culminating book. I was invited to deliver a lecture on my work and on O'Leary, which I did in November uh, last year. While in New Mexico, I was fortunate enough to be able to spend time with the writer Lucy Lippard. In Lucy's essay, Beyond the Beauty Strip, which appears in the book Land Art, a Cultural Ecology Handbook, she says, Today, sparked by indisputable proof of human agency and climate change, the environment is in the centre foreground. It has become the radical edge, but the handle on that, on that edge remains the land itself, how we see, understand, use and respond to it. Lippard goes on to say that society produces our view of nature and that artists are complicit in the way the world is seen. This message is fundamental to an understanding of my multidisciplinary practice as an artist. How we perceive and contemplate the land affects how we live in the, on the land. If we see the land as separate from ourselves, we are less likely to honour and re respect it. As an artist who has held strong concerns for, environmental, uh, for the environment for many years, my most recent gallery work focuses on the veneration of trees a subject I was drawn to not only for the magnitude of its environmental significance, but its universal and pan-religious symbolic importance. My investigation and resultant work has spanned two continents, Australia and India. The gallery-based arti artistic output centres on perceptions of land in the Australian desert, in particular the lone tree. My process, I was trained as a painter, and my process is similar to that of a painter, whereby I layer or glaze light onto specially chosen trees that may otherwise have been disregarded and ignored, sometimes not considered particularly beautiful, and concentrating on its individual qualities or personality. This process hopefully draws out the tree, making it special, individualistic, and most importantly, giving it an altered perception. So these are some of the works that I had in my exhibition last year, and they're all uh, taken at night, obviously, um, and this is not on fire, it's all with light, candles, torches, things like that, um, and they're all taken out around Fowler's Gap region. Finally, in India, I've been focusing on sacred or venerated trees, and this occurred because someone saw my work of the trees that I, um, I was photographing in Australia, and they said, if you like trees, you should go to India. It's an amazing there because they actually decorate the tree and so since 2003 I've been travelling there just about every year and have now nearly been to every single state. It's an incredible process. 
So the veneration of the tree in India is an historic, but also a contemporary practice and may be found across the country. Sacred trees are worshipped by tribal animists and are considered the abode of the gods by many other religions, including Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism. The sacred tree, or Salavrikshas, please excuse my pronunciation if that's incorrect, is perceived as a form that exists in both mythical and present time and that traverses the three worlds of heaven, the earth and the underworld. These trees act as a signifier, taking us back to an ancient form of visualisation. This particular installation is in uh, Tamil Nadu and it is a marriage installation. All those trees are covered with yellow turmeric. So it's quite extraordinary, not, in terms of, not only in terms of colour, but also in terms of smell. And so if women are looking to find the perfect husband, um, they go and write little notes. You can see that there's little bits of paper sort of tied around the tree, and it's usually also tied, tied onto the tree with a little piece of the turmeric. But normally there is a, the belief that one of their gods, in this instance a, f a female deity, um, resides in these trees and so she will answer their prayers. This is another fertility and marriage tree and you'll see that at the bottom of the tree um, are again the yellow cords with the turmeric and that is representative of what they call in India the tali and when a woman marries in India they, they have um, the tali, is, it's a bit like the wedding ring. Um, if they're wealthy they have gold necklace and people who can't afford the gold have the yellow uh, string with the turmeric. So women who were in uh, searching for a husband, they tie again this around the tree. And then if a woman hasn't had a child within the first year of her marriage, um, she goes and does this um, ritual to conceive a child. And so those pieces of cloth, in fact, um, contain sometimes, you know, little gifts to the, the gods and they're hung there um, for the wish of, of conceiving. Fertility of women is not the only reason for uh, these trees to be venerated. The farmers uh, do wonderful things with trees in terms of fertility of the land. So this is a sacred bamboo grove uh, in Orissa. And also, it's all over India, it's extraordinary, and it differs in, from state to state. Um, this is actually an interesting tree in that it's um, in India, well certainly under, in Hinduism, you don't just worship the god. I mean, you also have to make sure the, the demons and the semi-demons are happy. So this is actually a cat on tree um, to the semi-demons of that area. And this is also in the Himalayas. And one of the things I found interesting uh, in, in the Himalayas was that they only use metal objects. So uh, these were predominantly uh, tridents like Shiva tridents, for example. Um, but if people couldn't afford to have a, a metal trident made, they'd just put anything metal they had. So there were old saucepans, uh, broken old bikes, and all sorts of things around the, decorating this particular tree. Again, in Tamil Nadu, you, uh, Tamil Nadu is particularly strong when it comes to this practice. Uh, you, the, the ancient Dravidian religion, um, which predates Hinduism, you had a god named Ayana, and you would always have Ayana, his officials, his soldiers, so to speak, and their horses would be on the edge of villages uh, pr to protect the village. So they're basically there protecting the village and the surrounding farmland. And this is one for healing. So it's, it's often uh, talked about similarly as we would speak of lords in France. So if you're sick in some way, um, you go there. And in fact, the temple, there's no temple, it's just trees. This is another one to um, up near Bodhgaya and it's actually for people's ancestors so to make sure that uh, when your relatives die that they have a good afterlife. People even decorate trees to the traffic goddess and what that means is, um, this is in Orissa as well, this is uh, on a very busy dangerous road near Bhubaneswar. So people would stop there and um, pray that they'd have a safe journey and then of course decorate the tree and what normally happens is that they'd also leave things of value and after a while if the local priest had enough funds to build a temple they'd actually do that. So this temple here, this blue structure, is built around the tree. That, this tree is actually growing inside 
this temple. And if you think there's a lot of decoration on the outside, you should have seen the inside. It was quite extraordinary. The decorated tree is perceived as a form that houses the sacred and thus is protected. And this is what really interested me. Even the most rapacious Indian businessman would n not dare to cut down a sacred tree, which is recognised through its adornment. To walk through the natural environment and stumble across one of these transformed trees can be a profound experience for the beholder, an experience that involves all the senses. This living art is available for all. So to finish, we've come to realise that a shift in consciousness is vital if we are to re-establish a relationship with the land based on mutual respect rather than the manipulative and exploitative attitude evident in our current behavioural paradigm. Can we learn to live in a waterless land? Can we love it, respect it and nurture it? Can we allow this land to be itself rather than what we want it to be? Elyri aims to foster interdisciplinary research that has the potential to answer these questions and many more. We invite artists and other groups to present proposals that question the present paradigms that exist and that initiate innovative projects with practical applications for the challenge of living in an increasingly dry environment. We are open to all disciplines and, are, and welcome ideas, no matter how playful or bizarre they may seem. History has shown many examples of ideas considered absurd that have now become integral to our lives. Thank you.